Actually, uh, somewhat similar to the talk I did this morning. Um, they're both about uh, a bunch of very small topics, not, not very related. This one is slightly less serious than this morning's talk. So it's Grail's worst practices. Nope. All right. As a, uh, as a warning, um, everything I'm going to say here is uh, these are very important ideas, and I'm going to be 100% serious. All right, so the, the, overall, the overarching ideas, the things, the takeaways that uh, I hope that you learn from this talk are that if it's easier, it's better. Finishing faster is better. You want to get home as fast as you can so you can you know, so watch some TV and eat some potato chips and drink your beer and wait to die. <coughs> Don't pick... 17 different possible options. Just if you think of a solution, it's, it's probably going to be the best thing. Just go for it. Minimize the time that you spend at work. Get other people to do your work for you. <coughs> Lazy is good. If there's a problem, it doesn't matter when you fix it. Earlier in the project, later when lots of other stuff has been built on top of it. Just fix it when and if you have to. <laughs> now, some of these ideas are a bit radical. They may seem counterintuitive. They may seem like things you wouldn't want to do. But that's not true. These are all important ideas. This is exactly how you want to live your life. Other people may disagree. Um, you may get in a little bit of trouble for doing this sort of thing. So make sure that you cover your tracks. Make sure that you cannot be traced. It cannot be the, the, uh, any potential damage that comes from this cannot be traced back to you. And in general, be more like your dog. <laughs> Simple is good. All right, we all love Grails. We love Groovy. Um, but it can be frustrating. And I find that um, at this point, I know Grails pretty well. And I kind of know where to go when things go wrong. But... Uh, Using new, similar frameworks, for me, it's Gradle. Um, so uh, admission, uh, small admission, um, I like Ant. Um, I don't use it anymore, but uh, I like, this is me being serious here, so I'll step over here when I'm actually telling the truth, okay? So I, I like Ant uh, because it's, you know, you get very large build files, and they're not very easy to, to do multi-build projects, and it's not very easy to compose files but you, you kind of, not everything's there, obviously, because it's an XML language that, that has a bunch of stuff underlying it that does it. But you can kind of, you can really see what's going on there. It's, it's more readable, it's more understandable. And on the flip side, Gradle, which is awesome, and you're crazy to not use it, but you have these tiny little build files that are like three or four lines of code. It's the DSL, and when it fails, and you don't really understand Gradle, because I don't, I, I don't really, I haven't gotten to the sort of the zen of Gradle yet. And when, when a Gradle build fails, I feel like a new Groovy developer, a new Grails developer, because I don't even know where to start looking. Um, and that's exactly the problem that I'm talking about here, is that Grails can be frustrating. It's when you, when you, uh, you go to a conference or you go to a something and you get all excited about using Grails and you go try the tutorials and it works great and you do this and it works great and everything's awesome and it, you get two weeks of just joy and pleasure and you're, you're just saying, this is the most amazing thing ever. And then... You try to go a little bit off the beaten path. You're not, you're not on the happy path anymore. And things go wrong, and you don't really know how to do something. And it can be really weird, because it's, there's so much magic. And the magic is great when it works, but it can be really frustrating when it doesn't. So um, Grails, to be honest, can be frustrating. Um, you get that close, and then... <laughs> so I think the, the important idea is try to think like a PHP developer. PHP is awesome, right? There's, there's so much stuff you can copy, paste, and reuse. The thing about Perl and PHP is that they're terrible, but there's so much out there. All the problem, many, many problems have been solved. So all you have to do is just find something that you can copy, paste, and go grab that, and you're good to go. It's, it's an inertia thing, right? It's, it's crazy to use it, but there's just so much out there that makes it easy. So you should do that. And Facebook uses PHP, right? They have a billion users. So it can't be wrong. 
You can use object-oriented programming, object programming in PHP but, or in, and in Grails, um, but you don't have to, so don't worry about it. So controllers. It's very important to have a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between your domain classes and your controllers. You would never want to use more than one domain class in a controller. That's crazy, right? So we have a, a domain class and a controller. And if you're crazy enough to use services, I'm going to get into why services are a terrible idea later. Um, you want one, so you have a person domain class, a person controller, the person GSPs, and the person service. Why would you do anything else? And in fact, when we uh, generate scaffolding, um, you say Grails generate all. That's exactly what we do. So it must be the right way, right? Grails gave you the code. It has to be the right way. The corollary to that is always trust generated code because it has to be right. A computer generated it. How could it have made a mistake? Put all or most of your code in controllers because it's just so much, it's so much simpler. You have these gigantic controllers and everything's right there. You know exactly where to look. It's not spread all over the place in tag libs and services and in GSPs and, and source groovy classes and Java classes and libraries. Just, just put it all in the controller. Uh, keeps it simple, um, nice and sim remember simple is good. You can't do everything in the controller though, so do all the rest of your work in the GSPs. And again, I'm gonna ask a question. If Grails doesn't want us to put groovy code in GSPs inside of scriptlet blocks, and to even be able to call the database through GORM, then why can we? So it must be the right way to do it. Now, there is unfortunately this gigantic bug in Grails where the maximum size of a GSP is 64K. That sucks. Because at some point, you're gonna, you're gonna hit that block and you're gonna get this error, this JVM error, because the, the class size that's generated from that GSP is, is too big. And uh, so at some point, that's, this, this pattern is gonna break a little bit. So uh, you may have to split your GSPs into maybe into two GSPs or something like that. But um, don't worry about it, it'll happen in the future. The future is very far from now. And uh, if, with any luck, you won't even be working on that project anymore. Some other sucker will be doing maintenance on it and they'll hit that wall and they'll deal with that problem. Testing GSPs is next to impossible, especially if there's tons and tons of, of uh, groovy code in there. Um, but it's not a problem that, that testing is, is, is problematic. This is, this is funny because um, on Stack Overflow, someone asked me a question. Um, what is the advantage of using tag libs over writing code in the GSPs? And this is, a, this is a serious question. And I was just stunned because, I mean, I try to advocate using services and, you know, using uh, tiers and domains and, you know, doing the right thing in the right place. Apparently the message <laughs> hasn't gotten out to everybody. And so I did a little explanation of why this might be a bad thing. When you're, if you're using, um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure when this appeared, two, four, probably. There's a new uh, transactional annotation. Now this annotation is actually really, this annotation is actually really cool. Um, you guys familiar with the difference between this annotation and the spring annotation? So there's, a, there's the at transactional in the, from spring, and that's the old one that we used to use. And then there's this new, new one that, that's, that's in Grails. It turns out that they have exactly the same feature set at some point in the future, uh, the Grails transaction may probably will have more features than the uh, Spring uh, annotation. But as it is right now, I believe that there, it's exactly a feature, uh, it, ex exactly the same. Everything's um, all the same. Syntax is supported. And basically, they work the, the same way, um, transactionally anyway. Um, so you can create new, you can say requires new, you can say not supported, you can say um, Required all that all that stuff, and then you can set the timeout and the the um, all, all the settings are, are are the same in both. The difference for the for this one is um, it's a kind of a, a kind of an obscure problem. But if you're in a uh, transactional service, right, and you have a the 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 example that I give when I talk about transactions 
is that you've got a, a, a regular transactional method, and then you're going to maybe write, to a, write some logging information into a database table. So you're going to do some real work, and then you also want to put some information into a, you don't want to write it to a log file, so you write it to the database, some, some uh, uh, metrics or something like that. If that fails, that's bad, but it's not, you don't necessarily want the writing of the, of the information about the transaction to uh, roll back the whole transaction. Um, so what you probably want to do is somehow, if you can, can do this, uh, is when, if that fails, um, let, it, let it fail, capture as much information as you can, write a log error somewhere, you know, um, using log4j or something to an actual file, and then a human can get involved and then figure out what broke and then maybe manually fix it. Um, but you wouldn't want that sub-transaction, basically, to take out the entire transaction. So what you can do is you can do that secondary work, that, that uh, writing to a log table, in a new transaction. So you would annotate the main method, the, the, the real method, with at transactional, whatever you know, settings. And then you would call another method annotated with uh, requires new. So it would create a whole new uh, transaction. If that fails, it'll roll that back. Uh, then you can do whatever logging you need to do and then it won't take out the, the original uh, annotation. If you didn't have a, a, a different annotation, then it would all be part of the same transaction and it would roll it back. So that's a very important thing to be able to do. But it turns out that if you are in a spring annotated at transactional service and you're inside of that method and you call another annotated method, it ignores the annotation. Because the way that the spring uh, annotation works is that it creates a subclass of your class at runtime and it's a, a proxy, and it has a reference to the uh, actual service in it, and then it intercepts all the calls, that's what proxies do, right? And it does all the work that needs to be done uh, before the transaction starts and or after the uh, transaction finishes. Um, for example, if you, uh, if you want to join a, an active transaction, it'll do that. If, you're, if there isn't one started, and then you can create, a, create one, all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're inside of the proxy already, and you call a method, then you ju you're just going direct. So what you need to do is you need to somehow go back out from the service and back in again through the proxy, right? And that's, there's, it's not that bad. It's, I mean, you have to know how to do it, and it's not, it's not that terrible, but it's kludgy and it's weird, and, you know, you need actually a reference not to the, um, not to the service, but the actual spring bean, the proxied spring bean. So it's, 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 it's messy. So um, what this new transaction, transactional annotation does is really slick. It uses an AST transformation to rewrite the, the body of the method inside of a, an at, a, a, transaction, a transaction template. So every method that's transactional it's, it has like its little mini proxy. So now when you call a method um, from another method, you're always going to be respecting the, the different settings. So you always want to use the at transactional from Grails because it has exactly the same feature set as the other one, plus it gets around that, that I don't, I'm not sure how to phrase that, but you know, the calling within the proxy issue. So, um, so that annotation is great in services. It's also great in controllers. Um, because now I don't even need to bother with services anymore. Because if I can have fewer classes that are you know, really big, that's good. Um, because why wouldn't you want to do transactional work in a controller? It's crazy to do transactional work in a controller. Sadly, uh, we can't use that transactional inside of GSP. Who wants to volunteer to report this as an, as an issue? Actually, not Jira. We switched over to Google issues, but uh, GitHub issues. So somebody please report this as a bug, and hopefully we'll get it fixed quickly. Until then, use with transaction inside of your groovy scriptlet inside of your GSP. Because with transaction is awesome. With transaction is a hack. Like I said, I mean, if all your business logic is inside of your controllers, you don't need services. You don't need to bother with all, all this stuff. Dependency injection and testing. And you can just test, you can just, if you can just test one class, isn't that better than testing two classes? It's got to be, right? So don't bother creating small focused classes, small focused services, um, or even to extrapolate that, uh, small focused methods that do one thing, do it well, are easily testable or composable. Um, just create, I say create one big taglib, one big controller, 
And uh, unfortunately, you know, we can't have one big domain class because every domain class can only basically go to uh, one table. So that's another failure of Grails. Um, excuse me? Yes, please. Yeah, we're going to get probably 25 uh, JIRA issues out of this talk, I think. Because really, it turns out that if you look at it with the right lens, there's a lot wrong with Grails. And we're going to find all about, about all of those here today. And if you do create services, it would be silly to share them in a plugin or something like that. Because if it was fun to run it right the first time, it'll be even more fun to write it the second time, and the third time, and the 20th time. All right, so idiomatic groovy. The uh, use def. Def is awesome. And it's really easy to type. If you look at your keyboard, the D and the E and the F are right next to each other. So you can just do a plup. <laughs> def, def, def. Because who needs types? Groovy doesn't require, your, require you to use types, so why would you? Because someone will figure out at some point what was going on. Maybe. If you are going to use def, uh, sorry, if you are going to actually specify the type, make sure you also keep the def in there. Because this doesn't look stupid at all. <laughs> Does it? I can't believe, I, I'm shocked when I see this. I'm like, the real bug here, this should be a groovy bug. In all seriousness, Groovy should not allow this. This is crazy. Why, why, what, what does that mean? Def string. If the Groovy runtime can figure out what's going on, so can your coworkers. And, and really, so can you six months later. Because I, I had a thing, I had a thing years ago when I, I, I wrote, I was working on a, doesn't matter what it was, it was an, it was an RSS reader. And we were going to take over the world with our RSS and, um, I wrote, I was, I was doing all the development myself, and um, it was a desktop app, and it was uh, using SWT, the Eclipse um, uh, equivalent of spring, uh, swing, and um, something broke, and I went to look at the code, and I didn't recognize the code. Now, I had to have written it, because I was the only developer on the project. I didn't know what I was looking at, and it, I had to learn the code to figure out why it was broken to then fix it. This is Java code. But it was not documented, it was weirdly named and just stupidly written. And um, so you're messing with your, not only your coworkers by doing stupid stuff, but also future you. Don't bother with methods because you can just use closures everywhere. And they're cool, right? I mean, like closures. You probably have a ton of people who don't even know what that means. So they're going to think you're really cool if you're talking about closures all the time. Closure? What's a, what is a closure? He, that guy's so smart. I wish someday maybe I'll know what a closure is. I tend to go, to go short on this talk, so I'm going to do a lot of these. Um, one thing that, that um, probably happens less nowadays, because we, do, we kind of prefer methods and controllers now, but you know, in, in before Grails 2, um, and it's, we, we still use uh, closures and tag libs. Uh, you can't use methods. They can't be tags, anyway. You can use methods, but you, they can't be uh, public tags. Um, but we always used only uh, closures and controllers. And you couldn't use methods, right? Yeah, I don't think you could. Um, you could have methods in the class, but they couldn't be actions. They couldn't, be, they couldn't uh, respond to requests. Um, and the reason for that it was that uh, I, I, I talked to Graham about this, you know, why was that the case? And um, the assumption was way back when, before my time, that uh, we could probably use uh, closures, being able to set the delegate and do metaprogramming and, and stuff like that to, to uh, do, have more power with closures than we could with just, uh, just methods. It turned out that there really weren't any opportunities to, to take advantage of that. Um, so it wasn't a problem, it just didn't help. And because closures are objects, and Groovy invokes them as if um, they're methods, and they kind of, they, they look like we're calling methods. Um, they're not methods, they're just an object that has a call method that, um, syntax, there's some syntactic sugar to make it look like a method call. Um, but you can't have a, like a base class controller, and have a call, you, know, you can't override a controller, a, a closure, because it's a, it's a field, it's an object. So you can't call super dot whatever because that, that doesn't even make sense. 
So for many, many reasons, controller actions should be uh, methods. But back in the day, they were all um, closures. And then what people would do is they would get, you know, they would get these big bloated controllers and they would think, well, let's move this stuff into services. And you'd kind of cut and paste the, well, copy the method into the service, take out the params and anything it didn't resolve, and then change that to be um, arguments to the closure, and then rewrite your controller closure to call the, the service and then pass it the request object and the params and all that stuff. Um, and what a lot of people would do is they would leave them as closures and it would work. So you, they wouldn't think anything was wrong. But what actually happens is that, um, and Groovy still, you know, you can still call, you can still invoke them, but they're just an object that Groovy pretends is a method, but Spring doesn't see those. So when it creates that transactional um, wrapper around the, uh, the, the proxy around the class, uh, it will n a closure in a service can never be transactional because it's not a method. It's not going to get proxied. So you're going to be silently introducing these weird, fail weird failures because you think you're running uh, transactionally. And you know a transaction, the core uh, pr uh, idea of a transaction is that you do uh, one or more things atomically. So they all succeed or they all fail. So you'd get these behaviors where people would complain and they'd say, they'd say you know, why is Gorel's transaction support failing on me? Um, you know, I, I throw an exception after doing two things and it should have rolled back those two, but they pers persisted to the database. And the answer is you're running non-transactionally because you're in a closure. So don't, read, don't click this and don't uh, read it. The style guide and language feature guideline. It's written by some French dude, um, Guillaume something or other, and uh, I doubt he would know anything about Groovy. Um, and I doubt that there's a tremendous amount of useful information on that page. All right, code reuse. Copy and paste. Yes, copy pasta. Because typing is just so much work. The cool thing about copy paste is that if you've got something that works and you want to use it in another place, you just copy it over there. Now you could use a tag lib or templates or helper classes or utility methods and things like that and move that code here into a shared place and then just call it from those multiple places. But that's boring, that's silly. And it's not like if you have a bug in this code and you copied it into nine places and then you, fix the, you find that there's a bug, it's not like you're gonna have to then play uh, uh, become a cop and have to search through your code and find all the places where it was broken instead of fixing it, fixing it in just one place. All right, get Stack Overflow contributors to do your work for you. Stack Overflow is pretty amazing. I, I like answering questions there. It's, 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 it helps me a lot and I like giving back. And what's really kind of cool is that I find more and more um, that Google is indexing Stack Overflow really, really well. And when I Google for something, something's broken, I can't figure out how to do something. Stack Overflow answers are quite often way up in the search results, and they're quite often either the right answer or they're going to get me most of the way there. So Stack Overflow is pretty awesome. And it gets you to satisfy a lot of those earlier things I was talking about. Be lazy, you know, get home, get to work, or get out of work as soon as you can. Um, you've got a lot of votes. It has to be good, so uh, slam it into your code. If it work, if it seems to work, copy, paste, done. One important thing is you need to make sure that people are going to an a answer your question. You need to lure them in, right? So uh, one thing that I see a lot is th this phrase or something like it. Can anybody please help me? And it's, it's just <laughs> Nothing makes me want to not work on your problem more than can anybody please help me? Just you've already asked the question. Don't also don't say my question is. I get, I have a love-hate relationship with Stack Overflow because there's a lot of idiots on Stack Overflow. All right, testing. I don't know about you guys, but I don't get paid by the line of code or, or anything like that. So um, don't bother writing tests because it's just writing more code, right? That's lame. I get paid to write features. Maybe they're not correct, but I got paid to write the feature. And then you do decide, all right, I'll write some tests. 
everyone's talking about writing tests, tester de development, and integration tests, and unit tests, and functional tests, and just had this talk on Jeb. Sounds pretty cool. Maybe I'll try it out. And then they fail. Some of the tests fail. Or they pass the first time, and then you change something, and then they fail again. So just, it was a mistake. Don't even, don't even go there. Because if you don't have any tests, you can't get yelled at for breaking the CI build. You're not going to get a phone call at 2 a.m. saying, fix this, because you know, we've got a release coming up. Let your customers find your bugs. They're great QA people, users, you know, because they whine all the time. They're always complaining about something. So just, they're going to complain anyway, so just let them be your QA team. It saves money, smaller groups. There's always time at the end of the project for documentation and testing. So don't worry about writing tests as you're writing your code. Just do it all at the end. You'll have plenty of time. Unit tests are the fastest, so they're the best. So always use unit tests, especially for security, for database, all that stuff. Use mocking. Even if your tests are really just testing your mocks, your tech lead told you to write some tests, you wrote some tests, I'm checkbox checked, I'm going home. It is not at all important to use a real database to test persistence. If I can write a test that, do, that calls get and calls list and calls find by age and gender and it returns data back and the data is correct, then it has to work in production. So we have uh, a unit testing GORM, right? the in-memory GORM. It's another thing I kind of have a love-hate relationship with because it's pretty cool. Um, but there's... Um, some really fundamental issues with it. The new hibernate mixin is, is really cool. The, the Grails tests, the, gr the Grails code tests are really kind of cool because um, a lot of them, uh, when, for testing persistence, actually spins up an instance of hibernate and, um, in, inside of a unit test. Um, and it goes against an in-memory database. And it, it, so it's a unit test that is basically sort of a hybrid between unit test and, and uh, integration test. So it's kind of the best of both worlds because it's fast, it's lightweight. And it's appropriate because it's actually testing using testing databases, database code with a database. And you don't have to use the in-memory H2 database. You can do your uh, integration tests, and you should do your integration tests with uh, a test schema of the actual database that you use in production. So if you're using MySQL, you create your own, you know, install MySQL on your local machine. Or if you're using Oracle or whatever, you know, you got your own test schema, whatever. So um, H2 database is cool, but it's, it's better to use the real thing. But either way, you know, using a real database is, is the key. Um, so, but we have this unit test um, helper, uh, you know, this in-memory GORM that implements GORM. It's amazing, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, but it doesn't use a database. It uses a concurrent hash map as its data store. So you can't test locking. You can't test transactions. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, I think even now it only supports long IDs, so if, you, if you're using a UUID or a composite primary key or something like that, you, you can't test that. And uh, so there's, there's enough of those little uh, things that you, you kind of keep hitting these walls. So then you either get false failures because there's a bug or a non-implemented feature or an issue with the in-memory GORM, or worse, you get false positives. If a test that should have passed fail, if a test that should have failed passes, that's terrible. Because when are you going to find out that that's actually bad code? Production. Your user is going to find that. So um, you should really only use the in-memory GORM when you've properly tested your domain tier, and now you're testing your controllers and your services and your other stuff, your tag libs, that call domain classes. And because you're, you, you want to focus on the, the class under test, right? So if I'm testing a controller, I don't want to think about database and persistence and all that stuff. I just want to have something that gives me results back from a GORM call that I can then test my, does my controller do the right thing with the GORM results? Does it, uh, given a, a, an error, bad data, does it, do, does it handle that failure correctly? Um, so that's the only time you should ever use it. But even then, you still get stuck on that problem of the fact that it, you can't test you know, transactions and locking and, and all those things. So um, I would say that any, pretty much any test that directly or indirectly goes to the database pretty much has to use an integration test or even a functional test. Um, so, but if you don't want your test to be a good test, then 
do whatever you've been doing. All right, um, right, because if if um, if if it's not important to test persistence with a real database, then why do we have that in memory GORM? Don't bother with uh, continuous integration, Jenkins, uh, Hudson, that sort of thing, um, because the builds are always failing. All right, security. This is a topic that I um, spend a lot of time on, being the Spring Security guy. Um, I like Spring Security, but it's really hard. So um, what you're better off doing yourselves is uh, rolling your own. Because we're all smart, and, and the best way to learn something is to write it from scratch, right? Because we all have infinite time to do whatever we want, and we, you know, we rarely have deadlines and need, need to use pragmatic solutions. It's um, much better to, to uh, roll your own and learn, really, um, how security works and learn what it feels like to um, realize that because of a mistake that you made, uh, your company just lost a lot of money because we got hacked. Because uh, the important thing is you learned a lot. And it's fun and it's easy. So, um, and um, string security and Shiro are basically equivalent. So I'm not saying don't use string security, I'm saying don't use any of those libraries at all. Another really important thing is uh, don't use hashing to store passwords in the database. Because um, how is anyone going to get into your database that isn't on your team, right? Um, and it's, it's really good to be able to read the passwords. Um, because if, if you forget your password, I should be able to mail it to you, right? That's totally secure. I get a... Uh, I've since unsubscribed, but um, so I was on a JBoss mailing list. And every month, it's not JBoss. I mean, it's a product that they use. Uh, it's a forum software or something. And every month they send me my email in clear text. You guys get one of those? Not necessarily from, necessarily from JBoss, but whatever that company is. That is so shocking in 2015 to get an email with, a, with my freaking password in the email. That's crazy. Why are you doing this? It's not like they're going to steal your money. Store passwords and source control. Because then it's right there. You know, you get a new developer on the team, it's right there. Everything's right there, right? It's called security by obscurity. Uh, because how are, has anyone going to get access to your source code? So this is actually an older slide, and, and I haven't changed it, but um, do you guys hear about this? That um, Someone did a... Uh, so GitHub has a... Uh, a Query API, a REST query API, where you can search through stuff, and it's really awesome. It's, uh, it's really awesome. And it turned out that, um, this clips, but um, you could, uh, it turned out that there were over 10,000 um, production S3 credentials in, in GitHub. Because people were putting their source, they're putting their, uh, their two, you know, you get the two passwords, you get the, your, your secret key and your key, right? And they're just throwing them into, into, uh, into a source control. And I had this sort of fantasy, because they, they've since fixed it. And now, if you do that, they will email you immediately. And uh, it, they're, they're really, it's really slick. They, uh, they have a, uh, a, I think it must be a git commit hook, right? And it actually scans your commit, and it looks for, a user, probably uses a regex. And they will tell you, <laughs> change your, your, your uh, keys, because you just hacked yourself. Because... There are other, there are people, there are hackers who continuously are scanning uh, public repos, looking for this stuff. So um, it's a ba very bad thing to do. And I had this fantasy of being able to create like a, um, a distributed uh, f file system, right? And you could use stolen S3 storage, right? So if I can find 10,000 accounts, I just take a little bit of each, right? If, you, if, if I were to use like all the available space, then they're going to find me. But if I use just a gig or several megs or hundreds of megs, and if I if I take a, a little bit from everybody, and then I it has to be redundant because if you get caught, then they're going to delete that data and then you've lost that. So you'd want to have multiple copies, but you know any, anytime you're doing anything like that that has to scale, you're going to use redundancy anyway. So you'd be able to create this sort of a poor man's distributed uh, file system through stolen S3 uh, credentials. Sadly, they went and fixed it, and now I can't do my thing. That would have been my way to become a uh, my dot-com millionaire. 
All right, data access. Always use fail and error true. I talked about this in my other talk. Um, don't bother using has errors. Just if, uh, if a user types the wrong data, they should be punished with an error page. Um, they shouldn't um, have a friendly, helpful message that says, hey, um, sorry that that string is invalid. Just take them right to the error page. Um, because they'll, they'll, they'll learn from their mistakes. And like I said, I mean, users are just so whiny. They're always complaining. So uh, th th they're, probably, they're probably used to it. It's just one more thing to complain about on a, a long list of things that they complain about. Worst thing about our jobs is users. My life would be so much better if we had no users. Because then I could just write whatever I want. First person shooters. The reason you want to use fail and error true is because exceptions are not expensive. And they're not terribly expensive, you know, sc freakishly scary, scarily expensive in, in Groovy. Um, I have a, a link here to, to one blog post that has a bunch of uh, lies in it claiming terrible performance numbers for creating lots of exceptions. I don't believe a word of it. Um, and in the other talk, the, uh, the little did you know talk, um, I should put the the both links in this one, but um, there are actually two blog posts that are overlap a lot, and they have a lot of information about uh, the, the supposed performance costs of, uh, of creating exceptions. Um, so, recall in Grails that when you call save, the that method returns if the if uh, so save calls validate, and that runs through all your uh, validation checks. And if, if one or more of the validation checks fails, then the save method returns fall, uh, null. And um, if it succeeds, then it returns the, the instance back again. So if it returns null, or even if you don't look at the return value, you can always check has errors. And if, it, if validation failed, then you can do something about that. You can either uh, go to the, go to the uh, GSP and use uh, the tag libs that, that show the errors, or you can loop through the errors and, and try to maybe fix it or do something intelligent or whatever. And then if it doesn't have errors, then you know, so that's a su success case, so you go to the next uh, page in the flow. Or you can use the fail and error true. So a little history um, on fail and error true. The, uh, we had some uh, Ruby on Rails developers on the mailing list who were using Rails. And in, in, in Ruby on Rails, in Active Record, th they have a similar save method. And if you call save and, the, and it, there's a validation issue, um, this is a similar thing to has errors. You can check and see what, what failed. Uh, and what you can do is you can say save bang with an exclamation point, And then that'll raise an exception if a uh, validation uh, error happened. So they wanted that same sort of a thing in, in Grails. So they might have been porting an app or something, or maybe they just wanted to have a familiar environment or something. So they requested uh, that we change in Grails that the support for adding, uh, you know, ex save exclamation point, and that would throw an exception. And unfortunately, um, you can't, um, you, we can't do that because it wouldn't parse. The, 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 uh, what's the, the, what's the word for the, the schema of the language? The, um, hmm? the grammar, right, the grammar. The grammar doesn't allow it. It could. We can change it. We can change Groovy to, to allow an exclamation point there, but right now it doesn't, doesn't support it. So the alternative was that, because uh, you could say save flush true or validate false, you know, save takes a map. Well, there are a couple, there's a couple different variants of the save method, but one of them, the common one that we use is to give it a map. Um, so uh, we uh, implemented it with fail and error true. It's a little bit verbose and a little bit bulky, but works pretty much exactly the way the save bang does in Rails, where instead of... Um, allowing you to check that has errors, it, it blows up and throws an exception. Uh, this is perfectly okay in a few situations, uh, but it is the dumbest thing to do everywhere. Really, just crazy expensive. And the biggest reason that it's kind of dumb is that those, the biggest reason why it's really kind of dumb is that's the same code, right? It's a success case and a failure case. The only difference is one of them has crazy performance problems and the other one doesn't. But the exception one is clearly better because you take them to the error page, you punish them for screwing up, and you go on with your day. This is, this is really funny. So this is from a few 
days ago, right? Two weeks ago. So this popped up, and uh, I didn't see it. I don't follow uh, this guy, but um, someone replied and said uh, you should look at, the, uh, he referenced, Jeff Beck replied and said that he should uh, look at my talk from Greech, my, uh, the little did he know talk, right? Or I also talk about this. And so I saw that, and I, I saw the notification. And uh, so then he went and looked at it, and he, if you click through that and you'll see the, the thing, he realized that that was wrong. But a lot of people think like this, right? Why isn't it the default? The reason that it's not, not the default is that it's stupid. Do you guys agree, I mean, am I ranting here? Do you guys agree that fail and error is bad? Given what I've said. Because it's all about exceptional cases. You, you use exceptions in exceptional cases. Now, Spring Security uh, does throw an exception if, you, um, if validation fails, uh, if your username or password is wrong. But there's a reason for that. And the reason is that Spring Security is implemented as a filter chain, right? So there's an arbitrary number of filters that um, are in order, and the order is important. And you come in at the very beginning, and you do whatever checks you need to do at each step. And it's kind of cool because it's configurable, and you can decide what to do, and you can add in your own. And so the order t tends to be very important that some things ha have to happen early and some things kind of have to happen at the end. Um, but because of the way that it's implemented and the because of the way that the servlet API works, um, because the servlet uh, filter um, API is very basic. You know, you just you, you can only go to the next one. You can't inspect to see what the previous ones were or the next ones were, or you can't do anything but uh, the, only, the only options are don't call the method because you either you know, rendered an error or did a redirect or something, or call next or whatever the method name is, I forget. Um, so in, a security, uh, in, in Spring Security, when you've got that filter chain like that, it's really difficult to, given a failure up in the middle of the chain, to somehow go, to do a go-to, basically, to, or to somehow handle that. So basically, they throw an exception to work as a go-to, and then they catch that, and then, then they do that. So that's, that's th there's kind of a reason for that. But in general, um, you have to expect that a user is going to mistype their password or that a hacker is going to not have the right password yet. Um, so that's not exceptional. A failure to log in is not exceptional. It's incredibly expected. People type the wrong things all the time. Um, and it's just, it's a mistake. It's not exceptional. It's not weird. It's just what people do. And so you catch it, and you say, tell, tell them what's wrong, and you let them fix it. Um, there are genuine uh, error cases, exceptional cases, and that's when you, want to deal, when you want to use exceptions. But validation is, in general, not going to be any, there's nothing exceptional about validation failures. So I thought the timing of this was, was kind of cool that uh, this just came up a couple weeks ago. All right, database transactions. They're difficult. D transactions are hard. Uh, but they're important, I guess. I mean, that's what people say. Um, but how do we even know how to use them? I mean, it's not like there's uh, a talk from two years ago here that I gave that has a whole bunch of information about how to use uh, transactions, and <coughs> transactions and grails. Here's another cool thing. Um, Gorm for REST is pretty slick because it basically gives people almost direct access to your database because you've got a REST API right into the domain class. It's pretty slick. You would want to secure that, I think, yes? I'm sorry that all my links are, are going uh, off the screen. Um, I, but when I upload the slides, I'll make sure that it's uh, the right format. But Spring Security REST, uh, Alvaro's plugin, it's awesome. Um, but don't use it. All right. So always use collections for one to many to many to many. Right? This is what we do. Um, so we say, you know, has many, author has many books, right? So it's uh, static has many equals uh, books, colon book. Nothing wrong with that. It isn't the case that uh, years ago, I think it was my first spring one, um, my plan was to do a uh, talk on a uh, bunch of GORM topics. And I ended up, the whole talk became really just that one idea of the incredible potential cost of using, a, a using collections and grails. Um, and the, the, the case that, that really kind of got me uh, obsessed about this was uh, I, was doing a, uh, I was doing a consulting uh, gig and uh, I was going in, I went in every Tuesday for like status meeting. So I was going in and I, I got there and they were freaking out. They were like, so we're so glad you're here. Oh my God, everything's failing and it's terrible. And they had done, I'll, I'll skip to the details of what they did, but 
um, they were getting all these exceptions in the logs, and it was, the disks were filling up with, with uh, stack traces. And because they were adding a, a role to the users pro programmatically, automatically. And because it must have been a timing issue, but um, they were getting these weird uh, optimistic failure errors on the role class, which didn't make sense. I'm, um, I have a new user, I assign a default role to the person, and I save it, and it blows up and claims that there's something wrong with the change that, the change that I made in my roles. That really screwed them with their heads because we didn't change the roles, we're just assigning the roles, this is crazy. What actually was happening was, uh, in the Spring Charity plugin, which is what they were using, and it was great that uh, I was there because uh, you know, I was able to fix this really quickly, um, you have a many-to-many -many between users and roles, right? So the way that that works is that you want to add a, you want to grant a user a new role, so you say user dot add to roles, role admin, right, and save the user. What happens there is that you've already got a collection of roles, and now you add a new one, and then it's it's a special Hibernate collection class that's dirty, check aware. It knows that that new thing is has been added, and then um, it uh, when you go to flush that, it detects that one change, and then it uh, the net result is that it adds a new row in the join table between user and role and that grants you that new role. But uh, Grails, because we want to keep things consistent in memory with, what the, with, with, with the state of the database, um, it, it's bidirectional. So in addition to adding the uh, role to the user's roles collection, which is probably pretty small, I mean, you're probably never going to have more than, in, in weird cases, dozens of roles. That's not a, lot, that's not a large number. But typically, you know, one, two, or three, or you know, a very few. So there's nothing wrong with that. But what, what was killing them was that w they were adding the user to the role's user's collection. Now that's scary. If you have a million users and a new person signs up, think about what's going to happen. You're going you're to say user.add uh, to roles, a new role, and then it's going to add the user to the role's role collection, role's user's collection. That's lazily loaded, so it's empty. So it's going to go to the database and load a million users. This actually happens. And then it's going to add in a million and first user so that Hibernate can then detect that a new one thing has changed and then add in that one row to the join table and then throw away a million users from memory. Does that make sense to you guys? So click the link and watch the talk. It's about 45 minutes. And uh, the, uh, this, is, this talk is from four or five years ago, but it is still just as valid today as, as, it, as it always ever was. So my general rule of thumb is uh, basically, don't use collections in Grails. Ever. Always use collections in Grails. For one to many and many to many. Because that's how the documentation is written. That's how the blog posts are written. That's how the Stack Overflow uh, questions are answered. Use caching. Cache everything. Because it's a performance booster. Use a query cache. Don't click that link, don't read it, and don't get terrified by the fact that the uh, query cache can be uh, more expensive to use than not caching at all. That sounds incredibly counterintuitive, right? It can be more expensive to use caching, which you're using to save performance, than to not use any caching at all, to just load the same thing from the database every single time. The article, again, it's a, it's, I think it's an eight-year-old article at this point, and it's, it doesn't have anything to do with Grails or, or uh, Gorm or anything like that, but it's, um, it's all about Hibernate. And uh, it's, it's um, tons of, of uh, interesting information in that, in that blog post. Yeah, don't worry about optimizing your queries. Um, just get the job done. All right, so uh, I'm sorry that this is a wall of text, but this is an actual code from, well, it doesn't matter where it's from. Um, but the, the kind of funny thing about uh, Gorm is that all those dots are database queries. Ensure you've loaded, right? Somehow you get that. Maybe get loaded that. And then ensure must have uh, multiple plans. So it probably says, uh, in, in the ensure class, it probably says has many plans, plan, plan right? Um, so that's a database hit. This is going to load a whole bunch of plan objects. And then for every plan, we're going to load all the customers for that plan. And then for every person inside of that collection, we're going to get the age of the person. So that's not like a bazillion database queries. That's not incredibly expensive. That's not something that should be optimized into one tight query that just gets that data that you needed. 
This is exactly the way you want to write your code. So don't share. Don't write uh, blog posts. Don't create plugins. Let them figure it out like you did, because screw them. Don't report bugs. If something fails, someone else will report it at some point. Don't send in pull requests. It's not like you're going to learn a tremendous amount about the internal workings of the framework by digging in there and fixing it yourself. Um, it's not like you're going to make the process a lot faster and actually um, make it more likely that the, the bug will get fixed. Don't read books. Don't read these books. Don't go on the mailing lists. Don't read the what's new pages in the release notes. Don't follow Grail's framework. There's no, no information there. It's mostly just a bunch of Graham's Instagram photos of his lunch. <laughs> Don't go to these conferences. You're not going to run into a bunch of amazing people who are inquisitive and brilliant and fun to hang out with and fun to drink beers with. Um, so that's great con for you, great con for US, Screech, Groovy Girls Exchange. Uh, there's also uh, String One 2GX. Probably, I imagine this is probably the last year we'll have a 2GX attached to that. Um, so some smaller ideas. Uh, don't use packages. Just put everything in one big folder. Keep it simple. Don't worry about documentation. Uh, don't write self-documenting code with intelligently named variables and things like that. Just get it done. Um, don't worry about, dependency, about using dependency management, uh, Maven uh, jars, uh, Maven uh, stuff. Don't download something once and reuse it over and over again. Just keep copying jar files into your, into your lib directory. Uh, use print line and, st and print stack trace instead of logging. Um, put whatever the hell you want in the HTTP session because you know, that doesn't cause incredible performance problems. <coughs> Scaling issues. Memory's cheap, you just throw more hardware at the issue, right? And whatever you do, don't buy that book. <laughs> Thanks.